So let's talk through some of the stronger and weaker servants of the greater good with a tier list of Tau Empire units in Warhammer 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics where today we're talking Tau. In this video I thought we'd do a tier list of units in the Codex, roughly how I'd rate them shaping up now the new book is out. At time of recording, Tau have recently had a very big shakeup with the new Codex bringing new detachments and a bunch of datasheet changes on top of that. At the moment, as it was with the Dark Angels, the tower at a slightly awkward spot. Currently, we're still waiting for Games Workshop to unveil the official points cost. We basically have the digital points that represent the index costs and the printed codex costs that might well give us some clues as to the newer units, but we don't know if a few things might change when they update digital points to reflect the new codex. In general, in 10th edition so far, the index to codex changes have been kind of small in terms of big points changes or anything like that. A few things tend to go up or down, though usually not enormously meaningfully. And so far, for the majority of new units, the price seems to have been the printed value or close with it. As for things like the Dark Angels Inner Circle Companions or the Sidonian Scatros for the Admech, I think between all the past precedents, it's unlikely that the points cost will diverge too far from either the digital or the printed cost for the new units. Though obviously, if they do, it could change things. This tier list will be my rough estimation of where things might turn up after those changes come out, as we already know most of the information with the full capability of the units and their detachments. Even beyond that, with my usual things for tier lists in Warhammer 40k, tier lists are pretty arbitrary. Some things could be ranked higher or lower depending on the army and the context, or just what sort of playstyle you have, or what units you value. And certainly since the codex comes out, the detachments will have a big impact. I think the single biggest impact will be whether or not you're playing Crute Hunting Pack versus Mainline Tau. Obviously, the Crute Hunting Pack is going to make all the Crute units far better. But other things could have a big impact, such as the Retaliation Cadre basically making anything battle suit that bit better. For this list, I've tried to be at least fairly detachment agnostic. I'll talk a bit about Crute in and out of the Hunting Pack as well. But just in general, I've tried to rate the Codex units into four rough tiers of how strong they are in-game right now. Overall, if it's anything like the Index Tau, I'd likely rate most of the units as genuinely very usable. They've got good internal balance compared with a lot of Warhammer 40k factions out there, though I do feel like some of them maybe stand out a bit for the positive or the negative. Jump me straight into it, and in Tier 4 I've chosen to rank the Tau Plains, the Tidewall Fortifications, and most Forge World units. The Razor Shark and the Sun Shark maybe aren't absolutely terrible in terms of damage for the cost, they do have a whole bunch of general purpose ion shots that they're likely to get the alpha strike with due to starting off the board, plus a couple of seeker missiles. But I feel like for the majority of people, they're just rarely going to be the right choice for an army. They're really not that durable for the cost, and being forced to start into a strategic reserve might be, not be something you always want to do, and that's a weakness compared with the on-the-board firepower units. They do each have their own advantages. The Razor Shark gets a plus one to hit ground targets, though is more expensive. The Sun Shark's cheaper, but gets bombs that are kind of awkward to use, usually at round 3 earliest, and only if your opponent doesn't move out the way. Unfortunately, unless they get any sort of major points cut, I don't really think they're worth the downsides over the very good on-the-board firepower, and it seems that Unlikely Games Workshop will give them any sort of points cut, given that for the most part in 40k they seem to be working on pricing most of the flyers into the sort of barely usable sort of section. Otherwise down here I've also chosen to rate the tide wall fortifications, the shield line and the drone port are 85 points and the big gun rig is 90. They garrison a squad of fire warriors that can shoot out of them as they very slowly hover up the board, moving 4 inches and being objective control 0, but providing cover to things behind them if that's relevant. I feel like they are kind of interesting thematically, but they've just caught too many downsides to really compete with the devilfish. The terrible movement and objective control 0 are both kind of killer, Plus they don't have for the greater good to guide or be guiders, and it feels like maybe the strike team would have the best home with them. Though if you've got a strike team embarked on them, they won't be able to use that minus one to hit debuff rule due to the firing deck interaction. Overall, I think that you're going to do better off with Devilfish for these for the most part. I feel out of the three of them, I'd probably be most tempted by the gun rig. It's got 14 wounds of defense, so a bit more than the others, even if it doesn't get the invulnerable save of the shield line. And there's just the off chance that every so often it might actually hit with that big twin linked railgun and do something actually genuinely meaningful. Finally, for this tier, I have chosen to rank the vast majority of Forge World units here. I feel like most of them really are overcosted. 
I might have been a little bit harsh on a few of the entries here that maybe don't belong in the same place as the Tidewall fortifications, or on the same tier as the Manta, though I thought I'd talk through the vast majority of them here just to keep them all together. Running through quickly, the Manta's kind of a big fun model for more casual anomalous apocalypse games, but just not really practical, and you can't fit it in a 2000 point list. The Barracuda and the AX Tiger Shark aren't awful, but kind of similar problems to the above flyers. I maybe might have been tempted to put the Barracuda into tier 3, and I feel like the other Tiger Shark is a bit more usable, so I have ranked that a little higher. The Remora Stealth Jones have an interesting 16 inch movement profile, but are just way over costed at 160 points per pair. The Ivara and the Ravana are two Riptide variants that I could have been tempted to move up to tier 3. They really do feel very redundant to the base Riptide though, given that that one's 165 points and these guys are 200 or more. It'd be the base Riptide every single time over these guys for me. Finally there's the Tau Nar Supremacy Armour, pretty much the Tau Battlesuit Knight. It does have a scary stat line with toughness 13 and 30 wounds, plus some serious firepower guns, but it's just probably not really worth its weight in 800 points worth of other units. It does have issues with guiding and split fire as well, as if you guide it, then it'll be worse to hit elsewhere. Out of the four world models, the only ones I'd really rank as great are the rather nice Tetras with their reroll hits rules. We'll get onto those later. Moving onwards and upwards to tier 3, here are the data sheets that I'd consider kind of overshadowed. And before we get into them, I know I've ranked a fair few Crute units here. I said they're probably going to be a bit on the niche side for non Crute detachments. Though I've chosen to rank them here a bit more as if you're fielding them for a town detachment. I'll talk through them from the perspective of a hunting pack detachment as we go along. I feel like basically everything Crute will be in tier 1 to tier 2 for hunting pack. So I'm certainly not trying to say that these are bad for that force by putting them here. First up for the Crute Lone Spear, I do think it's a really quite interesting data sheet. I've chosen to rank it in tier 3 for more generic Tau just due to the points cost of 110 points that it has printed. I feel like at that kind of cost outside of a crew's army it's going to be unlikely to be seeing all that much play. Even if it is a fast and tough lone operative with move shoot move and a bit of damage output all of which are really good things. You can either give it the sniper rifle for a little bit of anti-character threat and more reliably marking units for crew rerolls at longer range or the more potent big hitting explosive spears, they could be quite nice for skirmishing with the enemies a little bit closer to the front line. To my mind I think the points are a bit hefty for it unfortunately at 110 points, though I feel like for the Kroot hunting pack it'd be definitely further up the tier list. It gets the enhancement for that Kroot hawk flock which I think is auto include for 10 points to deny deep strike to 12 inches, you could have that very safely locked down a home field objective if you wanted for that. And if you are playing the crew force then you're probably taking lots of crews along and the reroll hit rolls that it can grant for them is just going to be so much more meaningful. Overall great in the crew's hunting pack, probably a bit too expensive otherwise. I feel like outside of the formation that Shadow Sun for cheaper is a better deal. Upgrading to the ghost kill for an extra 50 points for the big guns that gets. For non crude detachments, I've also chosen to rank the Flesh Shaper down here. 65 points for sustained hits in melee and a 6 plus feel no pain type save, improving to a better one if you slay a unit in melee. And he also contributes a little bit of personal melee damage with some twin linked AP1 attacks. In all honesty, I do feel like he's kind of borderline even in the hunting pack. He does add a little bit more weight to a crew unit, both in terms of melee and a bit more defense, but it's not crazy for 65 points. Maybe it could be okay if you want to focus a bit of might on one unit that's going towards an important objective. Overall I'd be tempted by him in the hunting pack still, but pretty much definitely not take him outside of it. In general the crew units are pretty handy just for cheap distraction and disruption units. The last thing that you want them to be doing is costing twice the cost and trying to make them borderline more efficient. Next up is the War Shaper for 60 points printed in the codex. He's kind of like the crew captain getting a free battle tactic stratagem and the ability to negate battle shock. He also has some range and melee to chip in against infantry. Again, outside of the crew detachment, I would rate him as kind of bad, really. Most of the battle tactics stratagems just aren't very applicable to crew outside of that detachment. I feel like you might often just be using it on command point rerolls to charge or do a bit of extra damage or similar. But again, like the others, I suspect he's going to be a staple inside of it. The root carved weapons that you can get for cheap enhancement gives him anti-infantry 3 plus devastating wounds from the dart bow, which is genuinely good. 
I feel like Games Workshop might well need to FAQ whether or not his free stratagem works on the revival of a slain unit, though. I've seen multiple people make different arguments as to whether or not it works. Some saying it doesn't because he's off the table, some saying it does because you technically deal damage one at a time. Though even if that's the case, it's maybe a little bit tenuous given that he'd be alive but his squad will be dead. I expect Games Workshop will probably FAQ that with the Codex FAQs. If it can indeed be taken for him, it will be a massive boost to him, and I'm sure we'd see multiple in each crew list if he could basically guarantee that you get to revive your squad when it gets slain. If that's the case, then any extra damage and other things he does are kind of a bonus. Next up, we've got the first proper town melee unit in the Crew Tops Rampages at 130 points per 3 for the printed cost in the Codex. I was a little bit borderline as to whether or not to put them in Tier 3 or Tier 2. I'd probably say High Tier 3 or Low Tier 2. I think having a counter charge unit for the tower is genuinely a big asset. These guys can scout into the mid board and set up somewhere in charge range of an objective and maybe punish enemy units for pushing up too heavily into the tower battle lines with some mortal wound impact hits and a whole bunch of volume attacks after that. I think their biggest downsides though are that they have perhaps surprisingly low movement, only moving 7 inches and the mounted keyword means that terrain is going to be a real problem for them. Plus they just aren't really all that tough either. They do put a lot of wounds on the board, but at a 5 plus save, they're going to get chipped away quite quickly with small arms or anti-tank weapons. Even with the scout move, having a 7 inch move and mounted does mean that they're sort of likely to take some damage before they make combat, and they could get a very depleted unit. As ever with recruit units, if you were fielding them in the hunting pack, then they're far more durable getting the 5 plus invulnerable save. And are also going to be more dangerous, particularly with their mortal wound impact hits, triggering the damage criteria to get them a plus one to hit usually. On paper they feel like a really scary option for that hider unit stratagem as well. That could certainly get around their slow movement and having to move around terrain. Even if they had to spend a turn in the open, then if you can't shoot them outside of 12 inches, then they could be a really big problem for any enemy units pushing forward to take points. Overall, I feel like they're not awful. I'd certainly revise them upwards if they did happen to be a cheaper points cost than 130. Next up, we've got the Firesight team. 70 points for a cheap little lone operative with a bunch of sniper drones. They are a character, so could bear one of the observer type traits from the Montcar or Kaoyon detachment to buff other units shooting. They have a little bit of sniper fire, but really not much. And their unique rule is really quite poor with the rerolls if they get guided, given that they're just a small unit that's really not worth guiding in the first place. I feel like they aren't truly terrible for a cheap lone operative just to sit in the backfield who could contribute with a little bit of damage and do some observing. For lone operatives though, I feel like Ghost Kills and Shadow Sun are strong contenders. And if you just want a screen lone operative type thing, then it might be tempting to pay the extra 40 points for the lone spear with the massive movement potential. Next up, the Storm Surge is the tower's big titanic gun turret. It's covered in interesting weapon profiles, in particular the slightly terrifying damage 12 profile main gun within 24 inches. As with the tower now, there could be a bit of conflict of interest with splitting fire, with guiding making some of its attacks a bit worse. Otherwise, it's got the heavy keyword if it can stay still on all of its weapons to hit a bit better. Though I think that you might often need to be moving it to get range and line of sight. At the moment, barring any points changes, it does seem that it's just competing with a lot of big and efficient Tau guns out there. It's very rarely seen in tournament play currently and hasn't really changed meaningfully in the Codex. If you just want a massive amount of relatively slow moving scary guns, you could have three Sky Rays or four Broadsides for the same sort of cost as this. I feel like they're going to offer more overall value. As mentioned in the Forge World section, the cheaper version of the Tiger Shark that doesn't have the enormous rail cannon on it I think really isn't too bad as a gun turret. 275 points for a relatively tanky flyer as they go with 18 wounds, toughness 11 and an invulnerable save. This thing could deliver really quite an alpha strike from reserve if it wanted to. Two primary weapons that could be big damage D6 plus 6 rail guns or go for the ion cannons. Plus some more right volume fire from burst cannons, missile pods and sky spears. Plus a fairly enormous alpha strike of 6 seeker missiles which I think are a pretty big threat in their own right. It does have all the downsides of being a tower flyer that has to start off the board, but at least for this thing it could turn up and then lightly nuke a target off the board with that big volley of seekers plus its other firepower. Still though, I wouldn't really rate it higher than this just due to other good firepower that can start on the board not necessarily being worse than this. Finally for this tier, and again another very borderline one that I could have happily put in tier 2, are the Vespids. 
65 points for a cheap unit of deep strikers with neutron blasters. The reason to take these at the moment I think would usually just to be a cheap unit to do secondary objectives. Handy to have them turn up on the board and then they've got good movement when they're down. They don't have for the greater good so can't guide or be guided. But just on their raw stat line their firepower is nice enough against standard issue space marines a strength 5 and damage too. They are kind of fragile though and their return to reserves rule is pretty weak compared with most other factions versions. Ideally they'd want to be able to return to reserve at the end of the enemy turn like lots of other units can, but they have to do so in the movement phase, so need to spend basically an entire turn off the board, so aren't quite as handy at jumping around doing secondaries as some. Still not awful at 65 points I think, though I wouldn't really take too many outside of the secondary support type role. Moving onwards and upwards to tier 2, and from this point onwards I feel like anything here could definitely have a place in tower competitive lists. First up there's the Star Scythe Crisis Suits, they've got a printed points cost of 140 and they do mass anti-infantry damage either from burst cannons or tau flamers. Both of those could be kind of interesting depending on the detachment, Montcar and Kalyon might like the burst cannons a bit more due to triggering their buffs, and Retaliation Cardra might enjoy the potential strength 5 AP-2 flamers. Their abilities are to get 4 back and shoot and extra AP versus anything that isn't a monster or vehicle. And I feel like perhaps the real strength of the unit might well be in taking a commander along. Who could round them out quite a bit and make them not quite so useless if they don't happen to be targeting lighter hordes. They definitely can get quite scary and do seem like a pretty interesting way to handle enemy lighter infantry and troops. The reason why maybe a little bit borderline for them at 140 points is that their base damage really isn't all that big. They're certainly a crazily long way from the damage output of mass Sartic Ion Blaster Spam Crisis suits, and if they happen to be playing in a game without that many light infantry to kill, then they might just be a bit redundant. Their toughness feels just a bit so-so as well, now they no longer get shield generators anymore, even if they do have access to some of the best buffs and synergy in the army. Even having said all that, I could have happily ranked them tier 1 though, they do the anti-horde role very well indeed, and certainly could be another interesting one to deep strike within 3 inches in retaliation, Kadra getting some seriously savage flamers to tear apart the enemy backfield. Next up we've got the Fire Knife Crisis Suits at 165 points printed in the book. This one gets two missile pods or plasma rifles or a mix of the both. Their special rules are ones that allow them to hit fairly reliably, getting four rerolls against intact targets, reroll hit rolls of one against anything that isn't at starting strength, and ignoring hit modifiers. These ones feel like the maybe kind of classic Tau Battlesuit Jump Shoot Jump Crisis options. A bit more ranged than the Flamers or the Fusion Blasters, which means they could be interesting for that Jump Shoot Jump option in Retaliation Cardra perhaps. I feel like both of their weapons do come with big drawbacks. Plasma Rifles only being 18 inches now does limit what they'll be able to hit, plus their volume of fire isn't going to be great. For the Missile Pods they do get genuinely good long range, which is interesting. Though for a squad of 3 of them I feel like 12 shots at strength 7, AP 1 and damage 2 isn't all that exciting, even if they do hit really quite reliably. There's going to be quite a few things that just don't really care too much about that with higher toughness or higher saves. I still think they're interesting though despite that, just maybe not one to go absolutely all in on as your mainline damage dealers perhaps. As with the other crisis suits they seem really quite fun with commanders for a little bit extra dangerous firepower where they can also use the hit rerolls for this squad and giving them some extra interesting options, maybe enhancements like the one where you get to jump on and off the board. Next up we've got some infiltrators in the Kroot Fastalker Kim Band. 70 points for a Hordy style infiltration unit with some okay volume attacks. They're not going to do much against heavies, though they do mark a target for lethal hits and precision. I feel like the reason that they're kind of interesting is that they're fun with the Trail Shapers redeployability for perfect knowledge control of the bid board. The Trail Shapers redeploys happen after you know first turn, so if you are going first you could push them up and do disruptive first turn charges, if you're going second you could hide them as best as you can. Again they are really quite a lot better I think in Hunting Pack with the invulnerable saves and the damage boost that they can get, some nice control of the mid board for all the scouting units that are likely to follow them up. Realistically I'd probably rank them towards the bottom end of tier 2 or upper end of tier 3 given the competition from Stealth Suits and Tetras which both get infiltrate and are both pretty great. I have chosen to rank the Crew Trail Shaper here as well for 55 points for the same reason as the Fast Stalkers. The redeployability I think is really quite fun and the reactive movement is also very nice with a unit that's on the midfield objectives. Could just make them tricky to catch up with with certain enemies. He does have little to no damage but at least is the cheapest option, more for objective sort of play. And his hunting pack enhancement I think is kind of fun. It does mean that you can have one unit move extra fast, maybe threatening early charges on the enemy. 
Next up, I've chosen to rank Dark Strider and the Pathfinders here. I thought I'd mention Pathfinders first so they perhaps make a bit more sense to. Pathfinders are 90 points for a squad of 10 of them. They can scout 7 inches and choose to infiltrate if they're given the right drone as well, though I'd say that most of the time it doesn't really make sense to infiltrate them quite as much as some other options. And with their mark lights, they can observe twice if needed, though they are pretty interesting units to be guided in their own right given their scary special weapons. Both the ion rifles and the rail rifles can be pretty savage. They are quite cheap as well, not really quite having the same sort of spammed mass damage as the breachers out of a devilfish, but against heavier targets they're really not all that far off either. Could be interesting if you want a fire warrior type squad with a bit more AP and multi-damage threat versus the breachers jumping out to deal some damage. Their scout move does mean that the devilfish could move off a bit quicker as well, which potentially could mean that you could get them really far up the board in the early game. Dark Strider 60 points and his normal boost is to give a plus 1 to wound to Pathfinders, which if you want a squad of them to deal mass damage then that's not the worst deal in the world. You could have iron rifles or rail rifles wounding the toughest things around on a 4+. plus. He does contribute a little bit of damage to fire with his Relic Pulse Carbine Shade and he also gets a 12 inch deep strike denial as well. I've seen occasional lists running him solo to defend a home field point potentially. You might have to vary it a bit depending on opponent though, depending on whether or not they've got artillery or things that could reach and target him. Overall seems usable enough for 60 points, though not really auto include I think. Next up for 50 points we've got the ethereal. The Tau Empire's command point generation is maybe slightly unreliable. The ethereal farmer CP on a 4+. Which is unreliable but maybe not awful for 50 points in its own right. On paper it feels like they might likely want to sit in a strike team for a 5 plus feel no pain on a home objective. Though having to buy in an entire 80 point strike team does feel like you making the command point entire proposition for the ethereal just be a bit more borderline. It does make for at least a relatively tanky unit of infantry though given that the guardian drone gives them a minus 1 to wound and a 5 plus feel no pain. Interestingly, the rules worded in that you can farm command points while you're off the board as well. So in theory, you could just run an ethereal solo and just put him into strategic reserves until turn 3. He still farm the command point in the command phase or try to. And then from there, you could just see him as a disposable secondary objective doer or screening type unit. Would certainly die the first time that the opponent can deal any real damage to him. But maybe after generating 1 or 2 CP, he might well have done his job. Overall still maybe feels just a little bit extra and doesn't really seem to get that much competitive play. The command points are kind of nice but you also can't really bank on them on any one turn which does mean that any one strategy relying around them just isn't really going to be very reliable. Next up for the standard issue fire warriors we've got the strike team at 80 points. There's a cheap 4 plus save infantry with spammed pulse fire at strength 5. Fairly high OC troops and with a longer range weapon they may be a little bit more suited to holding down home field objectives as opposed to throwing themselves into the mid board like the breaches are. As mentioned they're minus one to wound with the guardian drone which makes them somewhat more tanky than you might expect against ranged fire. I feel like they actually got a pretty interesting boost that adds a bit more value in the codex getting a rule where one unit hit by them gets minus one to hit in the following turn. That's genuinely quite a nice debuff to have on a relatively safe squad just hitting it out to the enemy unit that most needs at each turn. Sometimes might not necessarily change what the enemy unit can kill, but sometimes if it's a big damage dealer that might have threatened multiple of your units, it could be a really big deal. I guess the dream would be to put that on something like an Imperial Knight that you couldn't quite manage to take down each turn. For the role of going forward to the mid board though, they don't really seem quite as dangerous as the Breachers plus the Kadra Fireblade in the Devilfish sort of role though. I don't suspect that they'd be about to supplant them there. Next up, 430 points, there's the Hammerhead, a cheap and dangerous tank with a great big gun with D6 plus 6 damage on it. It's got scary shooting with an inbuilt plus 1 to hit against monsters and vehicles and B-rolls from its targeting system. Anything without an invulnerable save does at least need to be fairly wary of this and it comes with an extra couple of Seeker missiles to help finish the job on the Alpha Strike. Already in Tau list, it was kind of a bit borderline versus the Sky Rays, and Sky Rays seem to be fielded a bit more. In the Codex, the Sky Rays also got full Twin Lynx guns for their missile system, which was quite a nice boost, I think. I suspect in context of that buff, the Sky Rays are probably going to be even more the way to go than they were before, unless points are adjusted meaningfully. Finally, I thought I'd rank a couple of the cheaper Crew Nuisance units here. Crude Hounds were printed at 40 points, now for squads of 5 of them rather than squads of 4. They scout into the mid board and move 12 inches. They can potentially advance and charge if they started near a Crude Infantry unit. And if they're near Crude characters, they can also actually threaten to contest objectives with OC1. 
In general, the main draw to take them, I think, would just be literally because they're a very cheap 40-point squad. With their speeds, they could be interesting for doing annoying move blocks or nuisance charges right in the early game to keep the opponent pinned back from the midfield, or maybe do secondary objectives in the opponent's board half right from turn one. I feel like their usefulness has gone down for that kind of role, though, if we are assuming that they are going to be 40 points rather than 30. It's generally the cheaper the better for those kind of units. Otherwise, the Crew Tox Rider did go up in maybe a similar sort of way to 40 points as well for a cheap unit. It did get some pretty meaningful stat boosts for that though. At least okay durability at 5 wounds, toughness 6 and a 5 plus save. It does get to scout if it wants to, and then it does hand out quite a lot of AP1 damage to attacks within half range. 4 shots with a big gun and then another 4 attacks in melee if it wants them. If you're playing an army with lots of crews, it also has a reactive shooting type rule, which might allow it to just take a little bit of chip damage out of enemy units. Overall, I feel like they're interesting enough placeholder and screening type of units. They don't cost very much and can screen a fair bit of the board out in your own deployment zone. And if lighter enemy troops do step up and try and take the threats to your own forces, they do genuinely have enough damage to potentially repel smaller or lighter squads. I still say they're probably a little bit borderline versus tier 3 though. And again, they will absolutely love the crude hunting pack far more than elsewhere, given that they get the invulnerable save and damage boosts. Finally, moving on to the choices I'd consider tier 1. Here are a bunch of units that I feel like might well be cream of the crop for Tau going forward, with some really powerful abilities to add into the army list. Starting out, I've chosen to put the Sunforge Crisis suits here, 160 points for brutal fusion blaster damage output for dedicated close range anti tank. These guys very much feel like the Tau version of Eradicators pretty much, getting reroll wound rolls and damage rolls, meaning their Melter Fire is just massively savage, while also being arguably the most durable of the Crisis Suit variants due to getting a 4 plus invulnerable save from their shield generators. I feel like they're pretty relevant in all the detachments, getting sustained hits too from Cow Yon, 3 inch deep strike and retaliation cadre, and advance and shoot and lethal hits in Montcar are all great in their own right. And I think they'd even be relevant in the Crude Detachment for focused anti-tank firepower, which the Crude don't really do themselves very well. They seem to work really well with any of the commanders out there as well. Cold Star to get them moving quickly up the board, the Enforcer for a focused deep strike one, and Farsight's interesting if you can deliver them into 9 inches, getting the plus 1 to wound. Doing a 3 inch drop with him in Retaliation Cardra does seem like a death sentence to enemy armour. For downsides, they don't really help out much against other targets, but given that they're dedicated anti-tank, they do their role fairly well, I think. Next up, and with Games Workshop changing their special rules around, I feel like crew carnivores are going to be fairly auto-include, at least if they keep their points cost kind of similar to this now. They already are pretty useful, I think, in really quite cheap scout horde type bodies with stealth, and they do have okay threat against light infantry with a bunch of strength 4 at range and melee. With their rules changes in the codex though, they gained that sticky objectives rule, which means a point remains yours until your opponent can actually take it, which is big. Nice to mark your home objective with that, and could be handy later in the game for the midfield. And they also gained objective control too as well, which was a really big win for a scouting unit. Between all that, they feel like a unit that you could easily have a couple of copies of in just about any list. Marking the home objective with the holding ability is nice. Plus just being a massive amount of objective control two bodies to move towards the midfield and skirmish with enemy infantry really seems like a bad thing to screen the rest of the army. I feel like they probably go from being just kind of great to being the single best unit if you're playing hunting pack as well. Getting a 5 plus invulnerable save makes them truly obnoxious to kill for their points cost at range. Plus they're the best unit to recycle for the two command points to bring 20 bodies back to the board for some Tau style reinforcement shenanigans. Next up, I've chosen to rank the Devilfish with the Breaches and the Cadra Fireblade. The Devilfish in itself is really efficient at 75 points. Really quite outstanding durability for that very cheap points cost. 13 wounds at toughness 9 and a 3 plus save is great for 75 points. And it even does have a bit of threat of its own. A nice Alpha Strike with a pair of Seeker missiles might certainly do something to the enemy. And it gets a little bit of volume fire with its secondary weapons after that. After it's delivered its cargo, which I'd say is likely going to be breachers, maybe with a fire blade to the front lines, it can then just be a nuisance unit, maybe guiding at your other units, perhaps doing secondary objectives or putting more points on primaries, or doing nuisance charges to hold up the enemy. Speaking of breachers, for 90 points, they each get two shots at strength 6, AP 1, and damage 1 at 10 inches, perhaps most scarily with the reroll to wound rolls against enemies that are on an objective meaning they're really quite general purpose firepower against pretty much anything there, unless it's ludicrously high toughness and a great save. 
They'll get better with a Kadra Fireblade. They get a Guardian Drone for a minus one to wound to give them a little bit more toughness when they inevitably get hit back. And they've got good objective control to jump onto that point and a Devilfish to get them there. Overall, they do seem to be one of the best ways to deal with enemy lighter infantry and take points in the midfield in the first turn or two. They can get some damage boosts from Kalyon and Montcar, and they do also have some stratagems to support them with combat embarkation or debarkation. Supporting them is often a Kadra Fireblade for 40 points. At that cost, he does seem to justify himself for plenty of people playing with the Breachers. His main rule is to give them an extra shot with all those pulse weapons meaning that you get 30 shots at strength 6, AP 1 and damage 1 re-rolling the wound roll if you target an enemy unit on a midfield point. He also does chip in a little bit with his boosted pulse rifle at damage 2 and extra AP on 6s, plus has the character keyword which occasionally can be important for some missions. Overall it does seem that the majority of people who are using breaches and devilfish to put bodies in the midfield choose to take these guys along. I'm not sure it's 100% auto-include if you're willing to sacrifice a bit of damage to keep the overall unit cheaper though, but in any case I'd still rate him as a very efficient add-on to the Breachers. Next up, I've basically chosen to rank all of the Battlesuit Commanders here. I feel like Games Workshop's done a good job of keeping them interesting and relevant in their own right. Commander Farsight clocks in at the cheap 90 points at the moment. His role's been traded out quite a bit with free stratagems, making them kind of interesting for certain battle tactics in the different detachments. And could still just be used for hit, wound, or damage rerolls in a pinch. His big buffing rule beyond that is a plus one to wound boost, which is pretty enormous for all the crisis variants, though you do have to get within nine inches. Might make him an interesting choice for that three inch drop stratagem in retaliation, Kadra, or maybe rapid ingress to drop behind terrain and then use movements to get within that range. If he does manage to rapid ingress, he's particularly nice with tank shock and a strength 10 melee weapon as well, which is unusual for Tau. In theory, he could be averaging four mortal wounds with tank shock before he gets that dawn blade to work. And he also chips in with a couple of plasma rifle shots, and he's a lot tankier than he used to be with eight wounds and a two plus save. A big upgrade on his previous in the codex. Overall, I still think he's a very interesting choice. If he does remain at this 90 points, I wouldn't be too surprised if he does wind up going up a bit though with the stat line improvements. I guess we'll wait and see there. For 100 points, the commander-in-chief of the Tau Empire firecast is Commander Shadowsun. I feel like she gets a long way just literally by being a fast-moving lone operative with solid enough anti-tank type shooting with those high-power fusion blasters and a few other infantry shots between the missile pods and flechettes and things. Beyond that, she's at least not incidental to take down for a lone operative given an invulnerable save, stealth and a minus one to wound with the Guardian drone, even though I wouldn't say she's stand out durable if she does get caught by something meaningful. And then beyond that, she can also be a synergy piece as well, an aura of re-roll ones to hit for units within 6 inches. That could affect her own shooting as well, which is kind of nice. And an aura of a small chance to refund command points when they're spent on units nearby are reliable, but kind of a nice to have. The biggest issue, I think, with her buffing rule is that the re-roll ones to hit is something that you can get in a few other places. Some units have built-in hit re-rolls of one sort or another, and both stealth suits and tetras will give you the same thing if they're being chosen to guide units. So maybe her use does depend a bit on what other things you have in the army and what sort of units you might considerably boost with her shooting rule. Finally, to round out the commanders, there's the Cold Star and the Enforcer Commander. The Cold Star 110 points and the Enforcer Commander 90. It still seems they're going to be really quite central units given that they're the ones that can make best use of the enhancements out of the various detachments. And they're still very scary damage dealers in their own right, being able to equip four flexible weapons, one of which likely a cyclic ion blaster. So now they're going to have to choose between things like plasma rifles, fusion blasters and missile pods for the rest. It's interesting that basically all the crisis suit units can give them their own damage buffs. So one of these in Sunforge will be re-rolling the wound rolls against heavy things. As well as these guys giving their own boosts. The Enforcer giving you reduced AP against the units which is quite nice for the ones that don't have an invulnerable save. And the Cold Star one making the unit incredibly fast moving with the ability to advance and shoot. It also gets the high output burst cannon which I think is worth taking compared with the rest as well. In general I'd say if you want an on the board commander it's probably going to be the cold star and if you want a deep striker type one it's probably going to be the enforcer. Almost certainly running one of the interesting enhancements out there whether it's exemplar of Cao Yon for getting that early or that John Bonner off the board one from retaliation Kadra. Next up for a couple of slightly godly buffing units there's the stealth team first. 60 points currently, and a nice cheap unit of infiltrators is generally a pretty good start already. They're at least fairly fast with an 8-inch move, 
get the infantry keywords to interact better with terrain, and some damage between a pair of burst cannons and a fusion blaster. The big improvement they got in the codex though was that now they're fairly godly with guiding marking abilities. A unit that they guide gets two reroll ones to hit and ones to wound and they'll also have a marker drone in the unit for ignore cover. It basically means that compared with most units guiding an extra unit these guys are generally going to do it better and they actually compete against tetras now. Overall between that and the infiltrate and being a nice cheap unit they seem borderline also include maybe one of the strongest units in the codex. And they even have that fun homing beacon special rule which could mean that you could threaten rapid ingress with a crisis suit setting up nearby. It's maybe a bit on the situational side depending on where your opponents move their units but could be handy from time to time particularly if you have multiple units. Unless they go up in cost massively I feel like these guys are going to appear in just about every army list. Otherwise though I still wouldn't write off the Forge World Tetras for 80 points. The self teams give you reroll ones to hit and ones to wound. The Tetras instead give you full rerolls to hit and it kind of depends on the units that you're guiding and whether or not they've got any built in wound rerolls or hit rerolls for which one is the most relevant. The Tetras at least on paper look like they're probably going to be best at guiding those some Forge Crisis suits which will often already get full rerolls to wound built in. And otherwise, compared with the stealth suits, they're kind of even on just about anything that doesn't have a standard buffing rule, save for things like Riptides or Ghost Kills. Otherwise, though, I still think they're a very interesting unit, even just beyond their guiding abilities. They're kind of a strange unit in an infiltrating vehicle unit that's actually surprisingly tough, perhaps partly just due to not having any real damage output at all. I feel like they've got quite a lot of value for just a disruption and nuisance units, never mind just their guiding abilities. They are a bit more expensive than the stealth teams though, and I feel like a lot of people might gravitate back towards them a bit, particularly as they're not expensive Forge World resin, and they do have a bit of damage output in the infantry keyword. Overall though, I still think that these things are pretty amazing. If stealth teams weren't quite so great, they'd be auto includes, but now there's at least a good choice with good merits to both of them. Next up, we've got the scary damage output of the Skyray gunship that does look like it's going to be fairly godly anti-tank for the Empire. Its Seeker Missile Racks get 3 attacks at Strength 14, AP 3 and Damage D6 plus 1, and then it's all hit with those really quite reliably getting reroll hits against Fly, and also now reroll wound rolls as those Seeker Missiles are twin linked. Even if it doesn't get the reroll hits against Fly, it can still at least reroll one hit roll with the Hammerhead style targeting array rules. It just adds up to very efficient anti tank that maybe isn't quite as dependent on guiding as some other things and moves around the board a fair bit faster than broadsides and isn't limited by the close range of the Sunforge. For the 130 points its durability is kind of fine as well and it does come with some backup anti-infantry killing guns, maybe burst cannons or some smart missiles. Overall seems pretty great for dedicated long range anti-tank, looks like it's be a rivalry between this and the broadsides perhaps. Next up I still think that the ghost kill is a really interesting choice, 160 points for an enormously tanky battle suit. It gets lone operative so you usually can't shoot it at long range anyway, but even if you do close the distance most things will struggle. It gets stealth, a 2 plus armor save and the ability to cancel damage twice per game, potentially saving it from some really big hits. Its damage output definitely isn't stellar given how hard it is to take down, but it could just repeatedly chip in some damage 3 shots with an ion accelerator for several turns over the game. It can just be a bit problematic for enemies if there's firepower that they just literally can't deal with whatsoever in any meaningful way. It definitely does pay a premium though for being a lone operative with a big gun. I don't think you'd really want to be using too many of these, maybe just one in a list perhaps, but it does seem pretty nice to have on a home field or a far flung objective, perhaps borderline tier 1 or tier 2 just for the annoyance and giving you an interesting counter to enemy gun lines. Next up for 55 points are the cheap skimmers in the Piranhas. These are again another interesting move blocking and disruption type unit. Scouting forward 9 inches and then going very fast with a 14 inch move after that. If you did just want to irritate an enemy advance you could just park these in the movement lanes in front of their deployment zone. Or even just threaten charges on things that don't want to be in combat turn 1. With that scout and that movement they could easily get there. And likely after delivering some fun anti-tank fire with a fusion blaster plus a couple of big seeker missiles. Again maybe not one to go too crazily hard on given that the damage output really isn't all that great and then maybe a bit better for getting in the way. I feel like they could be another interesting scout type unit perhaps as an alternative to things like crude hounds for cheap secondary work. They wouldn't work quite as well with terrain but just have a very very good movement in the first place and that could be kind of big. 
Next up, we have the Mighty Riptide, which didn't really get any data sheet improvements, though Games Workshop have just dropped the points cost to perhaps surprisingly low levels at 165. This absolutely does seem to have been enough to get them into competitive play quite a lot. A damage output might not be crazily exciting for those points, but it is just a nice unit to have on the front lines. Fairly tanky for the cost between the 2 plus save and the shield generator, and it has the nice ability to fall back and shoot, which maybe makes it nice for stepping up to the midfield, as it's not going to give you difficult choices between being locked in combat, you can still step back and open fire maximally with that ion accelerator, plus whatever secondary weapon systems you've given it. The Iron Accelerator is still quite good against the right targets, certainly infantry with 3 or 4 wounds wouldn't really enjoy being hit by that, and several of the detachments seem pretty interesting for it, the Battlesuit keyword for the Retaliation card are options, and the Big Gun would like lethal hits from Montcar to make it a bit more of a menace to tie toughness things. Finally, last but by no means least, we have the Broadside Battlesuits, probably the main rival for the Sky Ray, who I thought was at least relatively well balanced pre-codex with it. In general, people tend to take the rail rifles as opposed to the high-yield missile pods, and then I feel like plenty of its support options are kind of interesting. It could use Seeker missiles, plasma rifles, or that weapon support system. My favourite was probably the plasma rifles before, but they're a bit more questionable now they're only 18-inch range. In any case, you can still take any two from that list. Otherwise, they're really quite tanky in cover, and still have that slightly odd mortal wound protection type rule, which might work out from time to time in a pinch. They maybe seem like a unit that could be particularly interesting in Montcar, allowing them to advance and shoot when they're guided. The other main weakness is they're moving far slower than things like Hammerheads or Sky Rays, so might well struggle for getting lines of sight. Overall, at least from first impressions, and if points cost stay as I'd expect them to, I would say that the vast majority of Tower Empire units are at least pretty interesting and usable competitively right now. Given quite a lot of cool detachments to choose from, it'll be interesting to see what people actually make of the army. I'll certainly look forward to giving a look over for the points cost when Games Workshop eventually give them to us. Let me know your thoughts on the Tau Empire units in any case. Are there any that you would have ranked higher or lower here? Look forward to hearing your thoughts down in the comments below. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics. I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, and I do tend to post new ones just about every day. And finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Auspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that link in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep videos like this coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.